In the 20th century, the world population exploded. In this video, we will take a look at the demographic transition and what that could tell us about the future of the world population. For most of human history, we lived in stage one. This is not a great place to be. You could call it living in harmony with nature, but mostly it meant humans were vulnerable to the simplest of diseases. If you were lucky to still be alive to have children of your own, you would see many of them dying before you. Most of them in the first few months of living. So here we have two bars at about the same level. Mortality was high, here marked in red, and the fertility, the birth rate, was also high here marked in blue. About as many people were dying each year as were being born. The rates can fluctuate a bit with differences in climate and or conflict, but on a global scale the human population was more or less stable. We mark the world population in white. So to exit stage one of the model, we need to invest in our hygiene and our health. For some parts of the world, notably Western Europe, this happened during the Industrial Revolution. The food supply became more stable with industrialization, leading to fewer and less devastating famines. Basic medicine was developed to fight diseases, impacting large parts of the population. Vaccinations were developed and decreased child mortality. And the connection between improved hygiene routines in hospitals turned them from death wardens to health institutions. Of course, this development didn't happen overnight and took place over a long period of time. But the trend was clear the mortality started to go down. Parents who might have had eight children, only to see four or five of them dying before adulthood, now saw five or six or even seven of them survive. The next step is for the birth rates to go down, and then we have entered stage three. When children are surviving and we live longer lives, we become less dependent on birthing many of them. And life in the city also lessens the need for many children to help out in agriculture. Women during this period, in the First Nations to enter this stage of the model, started to gain political power, the right to vote and to educate, and to become a part of the workforce. Educated women pursuing a career, marries later, and have fewer children. This we will come back to later on. So on our curves, we see the mortality continue down, but starting to flatten out a bit while the fertility is dropping fast. This causes the annual growth rate to go down, but at the same time the population has grown and more people are now having children overall. So we reach a stage where the rate of increase is going down, but the actual population increase in numbers can still be as high or even higher. Finally, we have reached stage four, where the mortality is about as low as it can get. Most people are living long, healthy lives, and the people in the older age cohorts increase their share of the total population. The fertility rate go down to about point of reproduction, around 2.1 children per woman. During this phase, the population starts to level out, and finally, once again reach zero gain or loss, as many are being born as are dying. Of course, we have reached this stage, with a significantly larger population than we started with. This is the area of natural growth, where the population increase is happening. Now let's take a look at where nations are in this model. We mentioned the first nations to enter it, Western Europe, the United States and a few others. Most of these nations, if not all, are now in stage four. Any increase in population in these nations, apart maybe from that innovations in medicine can still increase the number of years people live, come from immigration. The fertility rate in these nations are on or below the point of reproduction. Many other nations have later joined in stage four. Mexico, Indonesia, Bangladesh, India, China and Russia are all now in stage four. But the journey there have not always been the same as for the nations who went before them. For starters, most of these nations have traveled through the model faster. Advancements in technology and medicine 
can be applied faster, meaning that what would take several generations 200 years ago now go in one generation. So-called leapfrogging, applying modern technology without going through all the steps that made it possible along the way, can cut costs and speed up development. As an example, few are suggesting a large-scale investment in infrastructure of landline telephone communication in nations with a lower GDP, even though it was a big step for, let's say, France and the United Kingdom to develop in the 1800s, a direct step towards mobile communication with smartphones and wireless service would be a smarter move for poorer nations of today. Secondly, politics can impact a country's journey through the model, both in prolonging and shortening parts of it. I have a video on China where I talk about the political decisions impacting the demographic development there and why it went so much faster than for other nations. You can check it out if you're interested. In many parts of Africa, the travel through the model is going fast. The fertility rate in many nations, and most definitely in the larger cities on the continent, is down close to replacement levels already. A journey that went just as fast as the most extreme cases in Eastern Asia, like South Korea and Taiwan. But in other nations, conflicts, a political failure to reduce the poverty levels, or to reach the entire population, including the rural, as well as the impact of disease outbreaks, not the least HIV AIDS, has stalled the development. No nations on Earth are today still in stage one. A few are still stuck in stage two, but close to all of them have reached stage three by now. A vast majority of the world's population now live in nations in stage four. And with that, the demographic projections for the decades to come is a stabilization of about two or three billion people above the level of today. This will be a much larger population than what we started with, but most likely we will once again reach balance and no population increase or decrease. In coming videos, I will look more closely at what factors are driving the fertility rate down and what they can teach us about the most effective efforts in the nations that still today have a high birth rate. I will also take a look at what stage five of the model could be and how the population loss we see in quite a few nations today could either break or develop the model. If you would like to see more videos like this, or videos in general about demographics and the state of the world, you can subscribe to my channel and you can leave comments down below on any of my videos about any topics you want me to cover in the future.